The Crucible by Arthur Miller. A note on the historical accuracy of this play. This play is not history in the sense in which the word is used by the academic historian. Dramatic purposes have sometimes required many characters to be fused into one. The number of girls involved in the crying out has been reduced. Abigail's age has been raised. While there were several judges of almost equal authority, I have symbolized them all in Hathorne and Danforth. However, I believe that the reader will discover here the essential nature of one of the strangest and most awful chapters in human history. The fate of each character is exactly that of his historical model, and there is no one in the drama who did not play a similar, and in some cases exactly, the same role in history. As for the characters of the persons, little is known about most of them, except what may be surmised from a few letters, the trial record, certain broadsides written at the time, and references to their conduct in sources of varying reliability. They may therefore be taken as creations of my own, drawn to the best of my ability, in conformity with their known behavior, except as indicated in the commentary I have written for this text. Act 1, An Overture A small upper bedroom in the home of Reverend Samuel Paris, Salem, Massachusetts, in the spring of the year 1692. There is a narrow window at the left. Through its leaded panes, the morning sunlight streams. A candle still burns near the bed, which is at the right. A chest, a chair, and a small table are the other furnishings. At the back, a door opens on the landing of the stairway to the ground floor. The room gives off an air of clean spareness. The roof rafters are exposed and the wood colors are raw and unmellowed. As the curtain rises, Reverend Paris is discovered kneeling beside the bed, evidently in prayer. His daughter, Betty Paris, aged 10, is lying on the bed, inert. At the time of these events, Paris was in his middle 40s. In history, he cut a villainous path, and there is very little good to be said for him. He believed he was being persecuted wherever he went, despite his best efforts to win people and God to his side. In meeting, he felt insulted if someone rose to shut the door without first asking his permission. He was a widower with no interest in children or talent with them. He regarded them as young adults, and until this strange crisis, he, like the rest of Salem, never conceived that the children were anything but thankful for being permitted to walk straight, eyes slightly lowered, arms at the sides, and mouth shut until bidden to speak. His house stood in the town, but we today would hardly call it a village. The meeting house was nearby, and from this point outward toward the bay or inland, there were a few small window dark houses snuggling against the raw Massachusetts winter. Salem had been established hardly 40 years before. To the European world, the whole province was a barbaric frontier inhabited by a sect of fanatics who nevertheless were shipping out products of slowly increasing quantity and value. No one can really know what their lives were like. They had no novelists and would not have permitted anyone to read a novel if one were handy. Their creed forbade anything resembling a theater or vain enjoyment. They did not celebrate Christmas and a holiday from work meant only that they must concentrate even more upon, upon prayer. Which is not to say that nothing broke into this strict and somber way of life. When a new farmhouse was built, friends assembled to raise the roof and there would be special foods that cooked and probably some potent cider passed around. There was a good supply of ne'er-do-wells in Salem, who dallied up at the shovel board in Bridget, in Bridget Bishop's tavern. Probably more than the creed, hard work kept the morals of the place from spoiling, for the people were forced to fight the land like heroes for every grain of corn, and no man had very much time for fooling around. That there were some jokers, however, is indicated by the practice of appointing a two-man patrol, whose duty was to walk forth in the time of God's worship, to take notice of such as either lie about the meeting house without attending to the word and ordinances, or that lie at home or in the fields without giving good account thereof, and to take the names of such persons and to pre present them to the magistrates, whereby they may be accordingly proceeded against. This predilection for minding other people's business was time-honored among the people of Salem, and it undoubtedly created many of the suspicions which were to feed the coming madness. It was also, in my opinion, one of the things that a John Proctor would rebel against, 
for the first time of the armed camp had almost passed, and since the country was reasonably, although not wholly safe, the old disciplines were beginning to rankle. But as in all such matters, the issue was not clear-cut, for danger was still a possibility, and in unity still lay the, the best promise of safety. The edge of the wilderness was close by. The American continent stretched, stretched endlessly west, and it was full of mystery for them. It stood dark and threatening over their shoulders, night and day, for out of it Indian tribes marauded from time to time, and Reverend Paris had parishioners who had lost relatives to these heathen. The parochial snobbery of these people was partly responsible for their failure to convert the Indians. Probably, they also preferred to take land from heathens rather than from fellow Christians. At any rate, very few Indians were converted, and the Salem folk believed that the virgin forest was the devil's last preserve, his home base, and the citadel of his final stand. To the best of their knowledge, the American forest was the last place on earth that was not paying homage to God. For these reasons, among others, they carried about an air of innate resistance, even of persecution. Their fathers had, of course, been persecuted in England, so now they and their church found it necessary to deny any other sect its freedom lest their new Jerusalem be defiled and corrupted by wrong ways and deceitful ideas. They believed, in short, that they held in their steady hands the candle that would light the world. We have inherited this belief and it has helped and hurt us. It helped them with the discipline it gave them. They were a dedicated folk by and large, and they had to be to survive the life they had chosen or been born into in this country. The proof of their values to them may be taken from the opposite character of the first Jamestown settlement farther south in Virginia. The Englishmen who landed there were motivated mainly by a hunt for profit. They had thought to pick off the wealth of the country and then return to rich England. They were a band of individualists and a much more ingratiating group than the Massachusetts men. But Virginia destroyed them. Massachusetts tried to kill off the Puritans, but they combined. They set up a communal society, which in the beginning was a little more than an armed camp with an autocratic and very devoted leadership. It was, however, an autocracy by consent, for they were united from top to bottom by a commonly held ideology whose perpetuation was the reason and justification for all of their sufferings. So their self-denial, their purposefulness, their suspicion of all vain pursuits, their hard-handed justice, were altogether perfect instruments for the conquest of the space so antagonistic to a man. But the people of Salem in 1692 were not quite the dedicated folk that arrived on the Mayflower. A vast differentiation had taken place, and in their own time a revolution had unseated the royal government and substituted a junta, which was just at this moment in power. The times to their eyes must have been out of joint, and to the common folk must have seemed as insoluble and complicated as do ours today. It is not hard to see how easily many could have been led to believe that the time of confusion had been brought upon them by deep and dark and darkling forests, deep and darkling forces. No hint of such speculation appears on the court record, but social disorder in any age breeds mystical suspicions. And when, as in Salem, wonders are brought forth from below the social surface, it is too much to expect people to hold back very long from laying on the victims with all the force of their frustrations. The Salem tragedy, which is about to begin in these pages, developed from a paradox. It is a paradox in whose grip we still live, and there is no prospect yet that we will discover its resolution. Simply it was this. For good purposes, even high purposes, the people of Salem developed a theocracy, a combine of state and religious power, whose function was to keep the community together and to prevent any kind of disunity that might open it to destruction of material or ideological enemies. It was forged for a necessary purpose and accomplished that purpose. But all organization is and must be grounded on the idea of exclusion and prohibition, just as two objects cannot occupy the same space. Evidently, the time came in New England when the repressions of order were heavier than seemed warranted by the dangers against which the order was organized. The witch hunt was a perverse manifestation of the panic which set in among all classes when the balance began to turn toward greater individual freedom. When one rises above the individual villainy displayed, one can only pity them all, just as we shall be pitied someday. It is still impossible, impossible for man to organize his social life 
without repressions, and the balance has yet to be struck between order and freedom. The witch hunt was not, however, a mere repression. It was also, and as importantly, a long overdue opportunity for everyone so inclined to express publicly his guilt and sins under the cover of his accusations against the victims. It suddenly became possible and patriotic and holy for a man to say that Martha Corey had come into his bedroom at night and that while his wife was sleeping at his side, Martha laid herself down on his chest and nearly suffocated him. Of course, it was her spirit only, but this satisfaction at confessing himself was no lighter than if it had been Martha herself. One could not ordinarily speak such things in public. Long-held hatreds of neighbors could now be openly expressed, and vengeance taken despite the Bible's charitable injunctions. Land lust, which had been expressed before by constant bickering over boundaries and deeds, could now be elevated to the arena of morality. One could cry witch against one's neighbor and feel perfectly justified in the bargain. Old scores could be settled on a plane of heavenly combat between Lucifer and the Lord. Suspicions and the ev envy of the miserable toward the happy could, could and did burst out in general revenge. Reverend Paris is praying now, and though we cannot hear his words, a sense of his confusion hangs about him. He mumbles and seems about to weep. Then he weeps and prays again, but his daughter does not stir on the bed. The door opens and his Negro slave enters. Tituba is in her forties. Paris brought her with him from Barbados, where he spent some years as a merchant before entering the ministry. She enters as one does who can no longer bear to be barred from the sight of her beloved, but she is also very frightened because her slave sense has warned her that, as always, trouble in this house eventually lands on her back. The Crucible was first performed in 1952. During the 1950s, a wave of anti-communist witch hunts swept through all areas of American society, and Miller chose to expose the horror of such investigations by retelling the story of the infamous Salem witch trials in Massachusetts in 1692. The Crucible. <laughs> He bid me come and tell you, Reverend, sir, that he cannot discover no medicine for it in his books. Then he must search us. Pray, sir, he have been searching his books since he left you, sir. But he bid me tell you, you might look to unnatural things for the cause of No, it. no. There be no unnatural causes here. Tell him I, I've sent for the Reverend Hale of Beverly, and Mr. Hale will surely confirm that. Let him look to medicine and put out all thought of unnatural causes here. There be none. Yes, sir. He bid me tell you. Speak nothing of it in the village, Susanna. Go directly home and speak nothing of a natural course. I, sir, I pray for her. God, God dear. Uncle, the rumor of witchcraft is all about. I think you'd best go down and deny it yourself. The parlor's packed with people, sir. I'll sit with them. And what shall I say to them? That my daughter and my niece I discovered... Dancing like heathen in the forest. Uncle, we did dance. Let you tell them I confessed it, and I'll be whipped if I must be. But they're speaking of witchcraft. That is not witched. Abigail, I cannot go before the congregation, but I know you have not opened with me. What did you do with her in the forest? We did dance, Uncle. And when you leaped out of the bush so suddenly, Betty was frightened, and then she fainted. And there's the whole of it. We never conjured spirits. Why can she not move herself since midnight? This child is 
desperate. It must come out. My enemies will bring it out. Let me know what you have done there. Abigail, do you understand that I have many enemies? I have heard of it, Uncle. There is a faction that's sworn to drive me from my pool, but do you understand that? I think so, sir. How then, in the midst of such disruption, my own household is discovered to be the very center of some obscene practice. Abominations are done in the forest. It was sport, Uncle. You call this sport? Abigail, if you know something that may help the doctor, for God's sake, tell it to me. I saw Tichaba waving her arms over the fire when I come on you. Why, why was she doing that? She always sings her Barbado songs every day. I cannot blink what I saw, Abigail, for my enemies would not blink it. I saw a dress lying in the grass. A dress? I, a dress. And I, I thought I saw someone running naked through the trees. No one was naked, you mistake. I saw it! Tell me true, Abigail, and I pray you feel the weight of truth upon you. For now, my ministry is at stake. My ministry, and perhaps your cousin's life. Whatever abomination you have done, give me all of it now. For I dare not be taken unaware when I go down before them down there. There's nothing more. I swear it, Uncle. <sighs> oh, Abigail, I've... Fought here three long years to bend these stiff necked people to me. Now, just now, when some good respect is rising for me in the parish, you compromise my very character. <laughs> I've given you a home, child. I've put clothes upon your back. Now, give me upright answer. Your name in the town, it is entirely white, is it not? Well, I'm sure it is, sir. There'd be no blush about my name. Abigail, is there any other cause than that you've told me for your being discharged from Goody Proctor's service seven months back? I've heard it said, and uh, I tell you how I heard it, that she comes so rarely to the church this year, for she will not sit so close to something soiled. What signifies that remark? She hates me, Uncle. She must, for I would not be her slave. It's a bitter woman, a lying, cold, sniveling woman, and I will not work for such a woman. My name is good in the village. I will not have it said my name is soiled. Goody Proctor is a gossiping liar. <laughs> Why, Goody Putnam, Mr. Putnam, come in. It is a marvel. It is surely a stroke of hell upon you. No, Goody Putnam, it is... How high did your Betty fly? No, 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 she never flew. Why, well, sure she did. Mr. Carnes saw her going over Ingus Hall's barn and come down right as a bird, he says. Now, look, you, Goody Putnam, she never flew. Look, you, Anne. Betty's eyes is closed. Why, it's strange. Ours is open. Your roof is sick? I'm not no. calling sick. The devil's touch is heavier than sick. It's death, you know. It's death driving into them, forked and hoofed. Oh, oh, pray not. I, um, how does your roof ail? Oh, she ails as she must. She never waked this morning, but her eyes open and she walks and hears not, sees not, and cannot eat. Her soul is taken, surely. They say you've sent for Reverend Hale of Beverly. A precaution on me. He has much experience in all demonic arts. And he I has that... indeed, and found a witch in Beverly last year. And let you remember that? Now, Goody Anne, they only thought that were a witch. And I am certain there be no element of witchcraft. No, here. witchcraft. Now, look you, Mr. Now, no, Thomas, I pray you, leave them not to witchcraft. They will howl me out of Salem for such corruption in my house. Anne? 